Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Tom Hogan, and I'm the uh, coordinator of the uh, Milwaukee Poetry Series. We want to uh, welcome you for our December reading. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Uh, the holidays are, are coming, and so we are very glad that you took some of the evening here tonight to come out and spend the time with us and hear a wonderful poet who I'm going to introduce in about uh, five minutes. I want to make some thanks first. Those of you that uh, have been here before have heard this, but it's, uh, it's really important to say. We want to thank the city of Milwaukee who has supported us. We're in our 13th season, and they've uh, really supported us uh, after almost from the beginning. We did have a grant for the first year, but ever since then, they've supported us. So thanks to the city of Milwaukee, and thanks to the Letting Library for their support. We are a committee of the Letting Library, and how many people know we're getting a new library? Everybody, everybody know that? <laughs> yeah, okay. We're getting a new library, and the, um, Grand Ribbon Cutting Ceremony is January 11th, 10 to 11 at the new library. The library is on track and things are going uh, as they should be. And so that's, uh, that is the ribbon cutting and the uh, grand opening. And there is some information out about that. If you're at the library, they do have a handout about it. And we're pretty excited about it. Then uh, in the afternoon that here, we're having an event. So our, our next event after, no, we have a reading. We have our January reading. Clem Stark is going to be here. Uh, our two events in January are still here. So our reader in, in January is Clem Stark, and he will be here. And after that, we are sponsoring, uh, we're partnering with St. John the Evangelist for the William Stafford birthday celebration. We are having a Stafford event, and that's going to be January 11th here, 2 to 4. And our featured reader is going to be uh, Poet Laureate Emerita, Paul Ann Peterson. Paul Ann, unfortunately, was not able to be with us tonight, but her, in addition to reading Stafford poetry, she's going to focus on his career as the Poet Laureate. He was the Poet Laureate for 21 years, I believe, in, in any event, quite some time. So that's going to be the, uh, the focus of that. And then after Paul Ann, we will have an open mic. So. Uh, please come, read some uh, Bill Stafford poems. And thirdly, I want to thank, I want to thank the uh, Milwaukee Poetry Series. We have an active poetry series committee. And one of the members who was back there, Emmett Wheatfall, uh, just walked out the door. So he's going to have an announcement. Here he is. So, <laughs> so we're thanking the uh, Milwaukee Poetry Series committee. And Emmett and and me and Dan, Dan Hobbs, right here. Can we give everybody a hand? <laughs> because you know, you don't have something happen. I say this every month, but it's really true. You, you have to have a group of people that are working on it uh, to have something happen. So I want to thank every one of you that have offered to uh, do different things tonight, to uh, set out the, uh, the food, uh, to run the uh, video to run the video camera, to uh, get out our chairs, and to, to bring out the chairs uh, if necessary, so we will, uh, we will see how that goes. Um, announcements. We, I know we have one announcement uh, tonight, and congratulations is in order to uh, Emmett Wheatfall. Emmett has just had a new book come out, and congratulations. Let's give him a hand on that. Here. And so he has a copy of his book. Do you want to say a word just about it, Emmett? Uh, it's a good book. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. Okay, sure. yeah. So uh, for more information about that or talk to the Emmett, see Emmett uh, after the reading. Um, we have two handouts for you. And they, they look the same. And one is, one is what you've seen previously, which has been out ever since the beginning of the season. And this is a, uh, a list of the readings tonight. This is the first time we have this. We, we sponsor other events. And so we have a list of what our other events are. And the first uh, one listed on that is the uh, event I just mentioned, the Stafford Birthday Celebration. 
which is January 11th here, 2 to 4 p.m. So please pick up, please pick up a copy uh, of this. Uh, I have my uh, smartphone back in my chair, so normally I would hold this up. And you can imagine that I'm holding up a smartphone. If you would please silence your telephonic devices and so they don't go off uh, when uh, Judy is reading. And I also left my flyer for the reading tonight uh, back at, at my chair. So I'm going to uh, introduce Judith from memory. And I, I have a copy of her book. So. We're very fortunate to have Judith tonight uh, as our reader. Uh, I first heard her read maybe nine months ago at a salon of uh, Penelope Schatz, and she was in the process of ready, being ready to move at that time, so she has done that. Uh, she's a resident of Oregon City. She, her first book won the Oregon Poetry Award for poetry in 2000. It's been down <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it is. Look, look at this, it materializes. So, it was in 2000, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. She won the uh, Oregon Book Award for 2000, in 2000, for... Passion. Passion. Hmm? passion. That's right, passion. Her poems uh, appear widely in publications such as the Bellingham Review, the Prairie Schooner, Tahoma Literary Review. Uh, she has had various fellowships uh, in poetry. Her second collection, Red Jess, appeared in 2006 from Cherry Grove Collections. So it wasn't all downhill. Her second chapbook, Pulse and Constellation, was a finalist for the Finishing Line Press Competition and appeared in 2007 from the press. Her second full-length book, Literary Litany for Wound and Bloom, appeared from Utter Chaos Press in August 2018. So it's a fairly new book. And her prize-winning narrative, Medicine Chapbook Mercy, appeared in March 2019 from Wolf Ridge Press. So she's had two books come out recently. She holds a doctorate. <laughs> she holds a doctorate in American literature from Syracuse University and teaches poetry workshops throughout Oregon. Uh, I did know that. Uh, I was very impressed when I heard her read at Penelope's. Uh, we on the uh, poetry committee uh, are very uh, happy to have her as a reader tonight, and would you join me in welcoming our poet tonight, Judith Montgomery. Yeah. Thank you. Two microphones. Could I be running for office? <laughs> <laughs> Put this down. Okay. It's still moving. How is this? Is this better? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for um, coming and stopping listening to the judiciary hearings on CNN or MSNBC, whichever you are choosing, and coming out through the rain to be here. I'm very grateful to be here, thanks to Tom and the committee and the library itself, which I have yet to be in because it's been in another place for a while. So we are, my husband and I are going on journeys to ex go to all the libraries in the system. And uh, so far we've hit four, we're, we're working on the rest. Um, I see that I have only one of my books here because Tom has walked off with the other one. <clears throat> and I do not have the poems memorized. <laughs> So if I could have my, my book back. This is a test, wasn't it? Okay, thank you. You definitely want that. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I was very lucky. I didn't publish any books for a number of years. And then suddenly I had two come up rather, rather quickly. So I am, um, I'm going to read from both of them tonight. And I have my little clock going, so I'll know uh, how much time I'm spending and let you get out of here in time. I'm going to read first from, from Litany for Wound and Bloom. 
Um, and it's divided into three sections. The first is called Womb. So I'll read a poem from there to begin with. Um, the title of the poem is Apoptosis. So I need to explain it. It's a medical term. In Greek, it means leaf fall. And in medicine, it refers to something much less elegant, programmed cell death, which means just the normal shedding of cells and material from the body. Apoptosis. Every month, her body prepares the scarlet garden, leaf on leaf of nesting cells to plump the shelter. Rich red bed stitched with spiral arteries, ready to bear gifts to feed the visitor. And every month, one packed golden drop releases, lit seed slipping down the sleek chute until that fortunate fall into the womb's open heart. It's come hither welcome to the brave egg yearning for anchor. But this time or that, the pursed lip of ovary locks the egg in place. Or this time or that, the sperm loll and perish, drugged away from match. A chilled breath begins to frost the unsettled center. The nest blebs, falters, loses its hold. Leaf fall begins. Wind sweeps the garden bare. There is no baby in this poem. Now, although that's to some extent about me, I'm happy to say that I had two boys successfully who are now adults. Um, but I have to tell you that one of them, as he was, when he was a child, had night terrors. And probably some people in this room have either had that or have children with that. And it's a very unnerving experience. <laughs> because when the child cries out in a nightmare and you rush in to pick him up, you pick him up and his eyes are open, but he's not in there. It's as though he hasn't come back yet. It's very scary. So night terrors. He is standing, screaming, shaking the rail of the blue shadowed crib again. Eyes glazed, opaque, open, but not to you or the lop-eared rabbit or the paper folded bird gliding white above the nursery lamp. His body is hostage to a phantom horse that tangles his wrists and reins and drags him deep into alien terrain. You cannot wake him to your breast, rush him wailing from the house, plunge into the moon-sharp street where elms play black in March and bare feet burn on frost. Talk him back from the terror, not knowing what he's seeing. Your nightgown whips your knees. Words clack and shatter on the ice slick walk. You would do anything. Gas and flame your library of books. Renounce the earth and its green rustle of bright sun, whatever it takes to fetch him home. So that's from the first section. Then I'd like to read you a couple poems from the second section called Word. Um, and of course, as a poet, I think of myself as a word girl, but so do many of you. Um, there, there are words that are expressed, but also some that are withheld or lost. And um, this poem sometimes is when I'm telling my mother's story, reversing the gaze from child to the adult, uh, when my mother was descending into Alzheimer's. Sometimes. An indigo cloak clasped at her paper throat. My mother is stepping deep and deeper into a mute forest, winglet with birds, a basket of seeds clutched in her hand. Once in a while, she remembers and scoops deep into the swirl and gathers a handful to sew all about her, strewing the path with her time-tested mix of done pearls of millet of Ethiopian Niger, tiny as rice, the richest black oil sunflower seeds, and so making a feast under her feet to delight the rose-breasted house finches, arrow-tailed swifts, her juncos, her morning doves calling, where are you, where are you, as they alight, 
as they light her path into thickening woods. Sometimes she stops to consider the narrowing way to right and left, storm-felled trunks stitched with sword fern and moss straddled by opportune alder. Ahead, a dim bramble of brush. Sometimes my mother looks back, turns around, around, slippered feet tentative over awkward ground laced with uneven root wad and rock under drifts of soft death. A vine maple's reddened and tumbling leaves brush her wrist, and she stops to point out the flutter, color, and call of so many birds to my father, although he is not on the path she follows into the tangled heart of the forest, close and damp after rain. These woods, vines and branches, holes and encroaching thickets, hers alone, or he cannot follow. Now streaking the dusk, one cardinal flares far from their New England home, scarlet-headed and cloaked, plump ensign who darts in and out of the cumulate dark to light on her shoulder, and she feels how she flies wordless under his heart, how she enters his heart and he hers. She picks up the basket, steps on into twilight, the cardinal weeping, his red breast sweeping and lighting the one way, one way. So lest you think that all I write about is family, I thought I'd read something that's a little larger. Poem written about 10 years ago before Me Too started, and I'm interested here in women who are telling or not telling their stories, whether it's suppression by physical means or by cultural. The poem is called Her Silences, and it runs into the first line. Her silence is endless linen wound to cripple her toes, binding ever closer the voices of her feet. Her hair bound in a snood of woven gold, a statement, custom, consequence. Her hips swash constricted by panniers brocade, floating re removed the more closely to corset her waist, breath, is handcuff, straitjacket, gag, her stiletto heel, hobble skirt, chador, muting verb and adverb of her stride, both bandage and wound, glitter and mesh that nets her tongue, is calling, witness, refusal, is shame, cinch, apron string, crib, is fear, of what she might say were she free to speak, <coughs> breaking forth from ankle, ear, hair, cheek, rib, hand, hip, lip, lips, breaking forth from tongue, tongue, unbridled tongue. <clears throat> okay. I'm finding my numbers here. <clears throat> Some of the places my um, poetry comes from is art or photographs. I'm just really interested. I'm a terrible photographer, so I don't even really try. We've just figured out how to do selfies properly <laughs> recently. <clears throat> but sometimes photographs, um, you see them in the paper or on the screen, and you can't get them out of your mind. They're just there. And that's when I realize that I have to write about them. So. Um, in this case, um, this is a poem in which the arrow of the gaze turns back in on the reader, or in this case, the writer. You may remember the Abu Ghraib photographs from Iraq uh, from some time ago, but that still exist and still live on. Simmer, bent above the battered desk, I aim to limb the long, pure streak of white that cuts through egg-blue dawn. The birch's lace serrated shadow as leaves begin to knuckle under to October. But at eye's edge, in my safe room's shadows, lurk the leash, 
the bitter wire, the hood that flickers out of other shade. The bleak objects insist, they summon the stained chair, the socket jammed with wrenched light, the gasp, the gasp of electricity that simmers in the wall's innocent plug. Common objects, rope, wire, match, knife, waiting ready to hand in every everyday American home. I too can insist on innocence, cannot be held accountable for skewed use. Others heft these tools in sweaty, sand-stung palms, considering how each might best be turned to terror. Now I've said it, how fear deforms object, subject, how it twists the blessing of stout wire tight about the most delicate of human parts, how the honed blade edges into flesh, leaving scarlet glyphs carved on body beyond, how the chair comes to weep its litany of piss and blood, how the young girl who crouched frightened in the belly of the stripped cargo plane, how in her mottled regulation camouflage she steps from shadow into sun. She cuts the next hood from a pattern frayed with use. The stripped wire warms in her recruited hands. Before me, she tests the human leash lightly in her palm. I open mine, the twisted rope burns. Now for something a little lighter. <laughs> um, this is, this is also from the last section of the book, which is called Witness, so you can see where that, why that poem went there. This is a different kind of witness. Um, my older son has been fighting several different kinds of cancer for six years, and um, he's in two studies. He's, he's had every experimental um, chemo that exists here or in England uh, to try to cure him, and things keep coming back. Um, one of the chemos was particularly dangerous. He, he would tell me what his next one was, and I'd look it up on drugs.com, which I recommend to all of you. Um, and I'd, I'd look it up and see what it said. And this one that he had had a black border around the warning about anaphylactic shock and death. So, of course, being a mother, I called him up immediately and said, have you read this? He said, I'm fine, Mom. My head just itches. You know, that's all it is. And the next day, this happened. But you, my son, because the drug that comes to cure you swerves instead to kill, anaphylaxis, Greek that means against protection, and because you sleeping alone in your dark bed are starting not to survive, vitals slumping on a distant monitor, life swifting away, and because the nurse's cell is calling, calling, but you, my son, are beyond picking up. You are coding, heart slacked, plugged, lungs crashing. She gears through stop and flashing lights to thrust the fail-safe key into your apartment lock. She bursts into the tossing dark where the great factory of your breath is shutting down, stalling, stop. She heals her hands at diaphragm and ribs, bearing down, press, release, press, but you are not coming back. Do not want to come back into your not protected body. She lifts the quick needle epinephrine to jumpstart the heart, fingers the antiseptic spot, and thrusts the sharp straight into that failed muscle, speeding vivid liquid home, restarting the engine that for 90 hissing seconds stopped, stopped, and you come back, called out of the amazing dream, out of peace, blinking, waked. Oh, dear my son, from now to ever you shall be heart marked where the shaft slid in to deliver antidote, to call you back into your life, into the shine and flow of ordinary oxygen and light. And he's still going. He's still swallowing down noxious chemicals and all sorts of things. I, I don't know how, how he does it, but I'm grateful for his persistence. 
<clears throat> okay, so more medicine. I went to, um, when I went to college, it was at the time when everybody was supposed to go into science and math and all this sort of thing, so we could catch up with Sputnik and the Russians and so on, so I was pre-med along with half of my friends. And after about eight months of a pre-med biology course, decided that no, no, English literature was really it. Um, so that's where I stayed. But I've never lost my interest in medicine. So the second book that just came out um, as the winner of the Narrative Med uh, Medicine uh, Poetry Chapbook Contest um, tracks the um, journey of my husband, good ending, he's here, uh, my husband and me through um, treatment for a rare cancer that began 15 years ago. So I'm going to start with, I'm going to read some of the poems from this um, path that we followed. <clears throat> Cozy. Tonight we bolt the door, draw trout print curtains to shut away the fraught world, escaped. This remote river cabin, ours for 48 hours. Slipping from love-rumpled feather bed and sheets, we admire the coved ceiling, the wide pine planks that glow overhead, thick enough to keep out driving rain or freeze, safe. The cut stone fireplace ablaze, we curl close on a plump couch. Sweetness drifts from chipped green mugs. Tonight, nothing can disturb us. Not storm, not phone, not even cancer, who squats on our stoop, flipping his gold coin in lazy arcs. The clock ticks to Monday, when he knows we'll have to crack the only door, fire up the truck. He will ride between us, cozy, he'll think, his silent good humor chilling our blood as he hums and nods pleasantly, first to you, then to me, one hand lightly resting on each near thigh. So the first thing that happened when this was discovered was a long seven hour, any of you are medical people, you know how long that is, seven hour surgery um, to try to remove the cancer. And then it turned out when they did a CAT scan, oh, it looks like it might have gone to your lungs, which is never the thing you want to hear. So um, chemotherapy was next. Well, the first time you walk into an infusion room for chemotherapy, it's really scary. You're looking around like, now what? What am I supposed to do? How bad will this be? And this wonderful nurse um, met us, got us settled, and so this poem and the book are both dedicated to her. The poem is called Mercy for Liz. We shiver. The room is not cold. We're sweatered up, red for you, blue for me, artery, vein, going and coming. We wait on needles. You roll up your sleeve, expose a pale vein, pulse under winter skin, infuse to pour into. Nearby, nurses lift the plumped sacks, poisons mixed to pour fire into flesh. Yours, others, eight stations of strangers propped, pillow chaired about the scrubbed room as nurses come and go in these hushed halls of chemo flicking scarlet nails to restart a clogged line. One blue scrubs, bluer eyes, stops before us, tray of sharps held at her waist. Liz, she kneels by your side, seeks your eyes and mine to assess the level of our dread. Lays her hand on yours, murmurs, we'll look after you. Slips a swift needle under swabbed skin, anything she looks at me, call me for anything. Rising, she turns to attend to our neighbor's port. You doze under meds. I watch, still on edge, as she leans to retrieve a chart. Her sleeve rides up past her elbow's pale skin. and the tender flesh, the mouth of an old reddened scar. What's that? Someone asks. Oh, that, she says. My stepfather stubbed his cigarette out on me. I'm not meant to hear, but I flinch. Sudden before me, 
the child's bared arm, her scrabbling feet as she tries to escape, his grip, her cry. How could she turn burn to mercy? Wounded, she heals. Blessed, we dare to drink from the bitter cup. So layered in between all the terrible things, it must be like flying an airplane, lots of boredom followed by disastrous things that happen you need to take care of. There are moments when um, something happens to give you hope. That was one of them. And this is, this is another, um, it's called Ghosted. While Phil was in the ICU, I was trying to take care of things at home and you know, get a little exercise and do research to counteract my worry. Ghosted. My hiking sticks won't hold. The road beneath my feet cracks in ice. Hunkered under clods of snow, blueberry junipers hang helpless for melt. I'm trying to keep my footing, despite a mind that tenter hooks tight to the ICU's stark light, your body pierced with tubes anchored to monitors and metal. Two tears streak and freeze burn on my cheek. Then, ahead, like smoke, five deer emerge out of nowhere, finally trotting in sprung steps. They float across the way, vanish into dusking woods. Breath stops in my throat. I want to take them for a sign. Their bodies flew at ease as they navigate a forest ghosted under frost. Their apparitional beauty, snow-combed coats, fawn nostrils loosing clouds of moist air. They're not a sign. I know they're not a sign for your survival, but it's offered. I take it. I take it in. OK, so. Um, Probably some of you have been caregivers or have been cared for or will be caregivers or will be cared for. So this is for all of you. Um, it's, it's called, you know, here I am with word girl again. It's called kenosis and it means the emptying of the self. It's in a specifically religious context from a quotation in the Bible that says, and Jesus emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. So unlike my other poems in here, or most of them, this form is very broken, so you will, it doesn't just run nicely across the line, so you will see that as I read it. Kenosis. Each day I will walk the dog without sobbing in the dry woods. Will feel the phone calls, abandon ink and pen. Will start awake to see whether my husband breathes or not, will not sleep ever again. The clock's red numbers blink bright as blood. I will empty myself, will not complain, will change his soap dressing twice, will tend his insistent wound, will tell him how well it heals, will lie, will lie down on the living room's red rug at night, will wonder whether there is a dying room or whether it is the whole house, will curl on my side, weep, helpless, will stifle the sound, will get up, will do it again tomorrow. And now for something a little lighter. <laughs> I am a firm believer in wishful thinking or magical thinking, as John Didion would put it. Um, and so sometimes you think up the way you'd like things to go, even if they're not going the way you want. So this is called Remission. The old blue prayer book used to simmer in its slot, reminding us to own up to things done or left undone. Only then could we ask for our sins to be sent back what remission means to say, return to sender, though it wasn't clear exactly who had sent them or where they might end up. 
I pictured some dead letter office in the sky where scuffed packages rose to a ceiling of transparent angels. Still, it wasn't easy to imagine room in heaven for all those taped up bundles. Much more tempting to sway to Elvis's lament, return to sender a dress unknown, to swear we'd keep those precious letters, giddy girls pressing his missive straight into our hearts. On my knees today, I'm puzzling how return to sender works for cancer, remission, gift read by radiology, offered in the doctor's office. Our white coat team has beaten back again that invasion. But remission isn't cure. It's temporary respite. Sent back's not good enough for us. I want every greedy cell hijacked, thrust deep into a box like a coffin, lid slammed shut, taped tight, package set outside in freezing fog, waiting for UPS to pick it up. Stow it in that comfortably dirt brown truck. Parting the curtains in our living room, we'd raise trembling hands to see Godspeed, farewell, which we do not mean we mean get out of town and don't come back. Hurrying, breathing free at last, the truck would gear up the drive, its brown robe driver raising one hand to bless us as he heads out into what we trust will be a bone cold occluding mist. Wishful thinking, very useful. Okay, I'm gonna read one more poem from here. Um, when, um, when they thought that it had spread to Phil's lungs, uh, they said, oh, it might be time to get a second opinion. Well, that wasn't like down the street. That was go to MD Anderson in Houston. So we got ourselves down there, and you know, the, the expert, expert, experts are there. They're all specialized in everything. You have these meetings. We met with a peer group of people who had the same cancer. We went in to see the, uh, the doctor who first said, oh, you have several more good years. And then he said, a more good year. And we looked at each other. Um, but there were times when there was nothing to do. There was a gap. And so they said, oh, there, there are these museums nearby. There's an art museum. There's a museum of natural science. And well, my husband being a wildlife biologist, that's the one we went to first. And there they had the most wonderful, what I could only call a butterfly area, a three-story glass um, enclosure filled with tropical plants and fruit where all these butterflies would flit around, all different colors, gorgeous colors. And Phil eventually gave up on me and went off somewhere else. And I, um, I just stayed in there and had a little um, recorder. So I was recording everything I saw, great, got home, a week later, turned it on, I'd pushed the wrong button. <laughs> so, but it still haunted me, you know, when something haunts you, you're just called there. So eventually I, I wrote it anyhow from what I did remember, which might have been actually a blessing, who knows. Um, in this poem, there are some names of butterflies. You'll recognize them when we get to them. Little Mutable. After we pass through the paired doors, after the dark, narrow tunnel has yielded us up, we enter the great crystal chamber, three-storied loft and flicker, harp strung in sun, into waver of shadow lace, green swerve of intertwined palm and spiraling ginger, lush habitat for the fantastic, and they appear, reappear. Hosts of butterflies flare through the damp press of air, sheltered by intricate glass, by skeletal struts that hold the outer world at bay. Within all is fluting shimmer, rice paper, blue clipper, red peacock, little mutable flames that glide as we, refugees from the cancer center and stunned by treatment, we glide in luxurious light, afloat in paradise, new drunk on pink flower spike, on corpse flowers purple rough display, on sheer color, sky swath, and caramel camouflage unfolding the air where we've been permitted back into the garden. A blue morpho lights on your sleeve, 
and our guide murmurs, Psyche, soul, its deep winged gleam, its resting, almost, might we say, blessing. And I, unchosen, confess a wish for such touch to brush me, who must be content as witness, translator of what might have happened here. Stay, oh, stay. We have our return appointments, must pass back again through the dark. This, only this, a radiance still seems to cling to your sleeve. Thank you very much for being so attentive. If you are so moved, my books are over there. There are special prices for Milwaukee Poetry Series, so they're marked down. And my husband has changed, so after you have any questions, if you want to wander over there, please do. So do we ask if anyone has questions? There's a question, yay! It's one I ask all the time. Do you have a process that you use to help you write daily basis, or do you just write when the muse strikes. A process. Well, first there is guilt because I've been playing spider solitaire for too long on the computer. <laughs> and um, I don't. There are people who sit down at nine in the morning and they write until one and then the rest of the day, they, I don't know, they play tennis or swim or something. Um, it's, uh, it's a couple of things for me. Usually I have to be, I mentioned haunted by something. So if there's um, a phrase or a, a photograph or I sit in front of a painting and it never leaves me, there's a George O'Keefe painting, it's the last one in her museum down in New Mexico that's called um, Horizon, it's called The Unknown. And it's, it's lines of color and I, you know, I took all these notes, everybody else of course was ready, they were moving on. Um, and I took all these notes and I'm still working on the poem and that was um, 20 years ago. Um, so some things just don't leave you. You keep thinking, well, I'm not ready to write it yet. Um, I do have, I'm having a residency up in Washington, um, the state of Washington, um, in June, where I'm just by myself. And um, I will get a lot of work done there because there's a lot of daily things. We moved back over here to be near our children. Who knew that they would all want to come to dinner at our house instead of inviting us there? So there's a lot of everyday things that get in the way. Um, some people do swear by sitting down and having a familiar thing to do, get the cup of coffee, shut the door, you know, turn off the phone, and so on. I, I joke about writing best when Phil is still asleep, that is to say unconscious, or gone, because then I don't feel self-conscious about reading my work al aloud, which is a, a really important thing for me. I read everything out loud because it matters to me how it sounds in the ear. So I'm sorry, I can't offer you an, a nice, no, neat no, there's option. Just, there's just a whole gamut that people have, and it's just, you have to pick and choose what mm -hmm. works for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. Tom? Two questions, really. One, one is a follow-up. You're reading the poems out loud even while you're by yourself. Yes, yes. Actually, I have, I have my own little system. Some people think this is very odd, but I'm going to share it anyhow. I take the poems I want to read and I put them on top of the jewelry box in my dresser where there's a mirror in front of me and I move everything off and I have a pencil and a piece of paper for changes and a cup of tea. And then I read, such as this book, I read it out loud from the beginning to the end. I don't actually look at myself, but it feels as though I'm doing a reading to people. So it works really well for me. I don't know if anybody else would ever want to try it but it's, it's, it feels like a formal presentation somehow. And I can't always catch where uh, things aren't right when I see them on the page, but when you hear them, you can tell where there, there should be a two syllable here, not a one syllable word. It just doesn't, it doesn't break correctly. And so then you have to go back and think about what else you might do. Um, the other thing I've noticed from, I belong to a couple of poetry groups, is that almost always people recommend I take off the first stanza and the last because I'm always explaining what the poem is about. They're so helpful. 
Um, and in fact, Diane Stepp, who's over here, was a big help on, on this book. She read the whole manuscript for me and sent me suggestions and so on, which was, um, it's really invaluable to have an outside person look at your work uh, that you trust, um, you know, who will say things kindly but firmly about what they think. So, yes? I do not fortunate to have a copy of Mercy in the hand, but we did keynosis. And what I noticed was, you know, uh, whenever someone sang something, we put it in italics, you know, we see the bell off, this guy, she says nothing. But in, in it, there are two words, one, two, three, four, five, six lines down. You put ever in parentheses, mm -hmm. you put again in parentheses. That's the only time that you do that. What was it thinking about putting those two words in parentheses? Um, you're asking me to go back for when I was writing the poem, which is a challenge. I think I did it that way because it was almost like an aside to myself, as though you're speaking to yourself on the side of the page. It probably had will not sleep, and then I thought, and then ever and again seemed like little extra things dropped in, and so I put them that way. I can't always explain exactly why, but I think in this case, it was like an aside to myself there. Um, if I put it in italics, that would have given it way too much oomph, um, but it was sort of like um, an, in a thread underneath the rest of the poem. What an interesting question. Uh, Tom? The other thing I was going to ask is that who do you read? Who would you say you were influenced by? Well, um, Emily Dickinson, Sylvia Plath, um, Jane Hirschfield, although I don't write at all like her, I write very differently, but I find her way of suspending words on the page that are so carefully thought out to be um, admirable. I mean, sometimes you can, you can aim thinking, well, I could, I could try to write the poem this way. I usually end up with a couple of pages worth of a poem, and my goal in life is to get all my poems down to one page. I have not met that, but it's a sort of, I, I, uh, I get self-indulgent about certain phrases that I love and I'm reluctant to cut them out. And I really need, I need to do that because they, I like to think of them as standing up like the lump in the oatmeal. If they call attention to themselves, then it interrupts the stream of the poem. So, but what I do a lot of, more really than getting individual books down, is um, I subscribe to journals that I admire. And um, there I get poems from all different sorts of people. Um, there's some online, the Valparaiso Poetry Review, I like a lot. Um, and um, I get To Hum a Literary Review and Rattle and a few others. Um, so I, I tend to go to those because I'll get all different poems and poets in there. Not as often do I get books out of the bookcase. Although I, I have to admit, although my husband doesn't know this, I didn't actually get rid of a single poetry book when we moved here from Bend, <laughs> even though, even though, <laughs> even though I urged him to admit that 19 screwdrivers was more than any person needed. <laughs> and I was told, I was told that every one has a special purpose, just like words. So there you go. Um, other questions about the poems or the reading or anything else? I'd be happy to answer. Are, how many of you write yourselves? Oh, lots of people. Wonderful. So what have you taken away that might be, is there anything you've taken away that might be useful for your own writing today? Did you steal a word or a line from me, I hope? <laughs> well, I don't remember when it happened, but at some point I started thinking about my grandmother. And, uh, and then I, in my head, I just kind of like, You're already starting to line something. OK, good. How about anybody else who's a writer? Anything you're taking away, yeah? Uh, I was really touched. My father had dementia, but my mother was the wildlife biologist. So <laughs> the thought of him walking through the woods alone was kind of interesting. That would be interesting because my bet is he would remember that
the names of all the things he learned when he was younger. It's yeah. the more recent stuff that's the trouble. He put names on the pictures of his cousins when he was tiny baby. Oh, a natural classifier. Yeah. <laughs> and he sorted the insides of the drawers really well. And he looked at the dishwasher, all the forks pointed one way, the knives pointed another way. And he married, and his wife's still with him. <laughs> people, people, people often have different ideas about how to load the dishwasher, don't they? Um, any other observations about writing or anything I can answer? Tom, you again? Yeah. Well, I've been thinking about this, and with a lot of your poems, do you conceive of them as starting out as poems? Or are you taking notes? So there's a lot of experiences that you're writing about. And just how does that kind of process go for you? And what I'm really asking is, are they notes and then they become poems, or are they poems right from the beginning? And Mostly they are notes and then poems. Once in a while you get a gift poem, like once every five years, and you just sit down and it just writes out, and all you have to do is change one word. And you're thinking, why doesn't this happen more often? You know, I've had just a few of those. Um, and then it seems like, oh, someone is speaking through me. This must be how it works. But most of the time, um, I have a real fear of the first draft. I love to revise. Above my desk is this big sign that says, revise, you know you want to. And that... <laughs> That's me. I actually have a t-shirt that says it too, but I didn't wear it tonight. I thought it would be a little too much. Um, but um, if I can make myself sit down and do a free write for 20 minutes or half an hour or even 10, um, then it's like you're playing. You're not really trying to write a poem. You're trying to work your way past what you're annoyed about that morning and into something else. And sometimes, if you're writing for 20 minutes or longer, the last couple of lines, all of a sudden, the language will rise up and be more interesting and a new thought or image might come in and you can leave it and then come back and type that up and put it on you know down and start writing more but it's the first draft that's hard for me once i get the the messy part out then like the uh the the botanist or whoever uh, i can i can spend time sorting and figuring out what shape it should be and the words and should i cut off the last stanza again or not mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have, <clears throat> excuse me, a, re a review group or friends you can um, say, does this work, or you know, uh, just provide that kind of feedback? It's really helpful to have that. There, are, there are two ways to do that. One is to take a workshop. Um, for instance, I'll be taking a workshop from Andrea this winter. And so even though I have these books out, I just love to go and learn and figure out other ways to approach things. So that's one. Um, the other um, is have, forming a group or finding a group to join with you. Sometimes there are online groups, which is really useful if you're living in but Minnesota. Practice. My practice is, I, I lived here in Portland for a number of years and belonged to two poetry groups, which is lovely. Then I moved to Bend with my husband for 18 years, so I started two poetry groups over there. Then I moved back. And thank goodness my two old poetry groups, my two former poetry groups, let's not say old, um, are still in operation and welcomed me back into their fold, which is just a, a great blessing for me. So yes, I find it's really helpful to ha be in a group. If it's a new group or a group starting, the important thing is to have some um, guidelines set out <clears throat> about, um, you know, we don't attack people, we don't say, mean things, we uh, look for what speaks to us in the poem, and we talk about what places are problems that we don't understand, so that um, no one gets burned in a poetry group, which can happen if, it's, if people aren't aware of this kind of approach. But that's, that's um, a very good way to do it. So go forth and find yourself a poetry group if you're not already in one, or a writing group. I usually don't do this, but I want to stand and tell you a quick story about Judith and her husband. Oh. I used to be recently retired executive of uh, 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 Sissa County Administrator Clackamas County. We have this huge diversity fair on campus, and I'm the head honcho in charge of the thing. And they both walk up to me and they ask me a question, and I'll let you tell the story. 
No, you started it. You finish it. You know how to do it. I don't know that, though. You know, somebody asked me, well, could you, Red Soils is the campus in which our building is on. And she says, what, where, did, where did Red Soils come from? What is that about? <laughs> I spent two days finding it. And I actually talked to our facilities guy. He told me what it was about. And we followed up and kept, little did I know that she was a poet. And little did I know that you were either <laughs> until I saw that you had a book coming out. And I wait, there can't be two Emmett Whitfields. There, there just can't be two of them. It just goes to her inquisitive mind <laughs> and her boldness. <laughs> That's high praise for, for me, the introvert. You know, I have to stand and hold on to this while I'm reading in front of all of you. So, um, any, any more? Yeah. I like your, I, I'm going to call it single focus, like that picture. Um, oh, God. <laughs> the Abu Ghraib pictures? No, no, no. The one with the stripes, the colored stripes. Um, George O'Keefe's oh. picture. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes that's what happens to me. I'll see something and it just, it just noodles around in the back of my head for a while before. But I like that. I like when that happens because then I can kind of focus on that thought and, and try to write. A lot of times it bubbles up, but try to mm -hmm. write it so that it satisfies. At some point it might be two, two stanzas, it might be one, but the point is, is that there are so many beautiful things and odd things and interesting things out and about. And sometimes those little tiny things catch your eye like a spider web with all of the dew on it. And I mean, that's a rather common image, but there are times when you walk out the door of your house and it's across the front of your mm -hmm. thing. You gotta walk through it. And just thinking about what that means and, and, and that kind of thing, I, I like. I, li I like to think that poets pay better attention than anybody else, which is probably a slander on certain other classes of people. But I think paying attention, giving something its full due, is a really important part of leading into finding a source for poetry, paying attention to what's going on around you, either in the world, whether it's the geopolitical world or your garden. Um, there's always interesting things going on and always interesting things going on in the brain. I should say that this is the, the top of the iceberg. Underneath are all the B minus C poems that you'll never see. So, you know, there, there are, are many. I just had a poem accepted by um, a, a journal called Redheaded Stepchild. And you can only send a poem to them if it's been rejected by some people, some other journals first. And you have to list what the journals are. And this one had been rejected by three, and I thought, oh, well, why not? I'll send it to them. And I just got the note this afternoon, yes, we want to take it, so yay. Um, it's especially nice if you haven't had anything accepted for a while, as in these two books came after a 10-year period when I had no books at all. I was too busy taking care of people, among other things. Um, I was publishing in journals, but not going this far. And I know, Andrew, you're going to need to make the Metro, the yeah, so thank you for coming. Appreciate it. I, I agree. Thank you all for coming. And we have some refreshments here. So please stay a few minutes and enjoy the refreshments and talk with Judith and talk to her about her books in about 10 to 12 minutes, maybe 15. Okay. And for anyone who wants to and help us put the room back together, that any help would be appreciated. I want to thank. Uh, so John the Evangelist for hosting us tonight. Theo Bukandil here is a representative mm -hmm. from the, uh, he's, she is with us tonight from St. John the Evangelist. And the group goes back together in a, in a rectangle. Thank you. over here, and she will direct it. <laughs> so let's give Judith another hand. Yeah.